program to all of you for coming and for what you uh, do every day. I um, really appreciate uh, what you um, what you're passionate about and, and the, the work that you do. I um, I teach undergraduates and I get to see people who uh, come up through um, through schools and uh, how excited they are to um, to, to learn science and to and other subjects. And I also have. Three kids, and the oldest is 13, so I'm also moving into that phase from a personal perspective. Um, just to tell you a little about me, um, I, um, for the, I, I said my group studies um, nanoelectronics, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, one topic in that area that I, uh, I hope you'll find fun. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been founder and then director of a uh, center from by the National Science Foundation for probing the nanoscale, finding new ways to uh, map out and measure properties of, uh, of electronic properties, magnetic properties, optical properties, because uh, the scientists and engineers have gotten really fantastic at building small things, but if we don't have the two types of eyes to look at them and see what we've made, then uh, close the loop and make more great things. Um, and, uh, and so we ran a summer institute for middle school teachers, with some high school teachers there, so I was pleased to see an alum number in that um, here. Um, so in any case, with uh, no further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how we can use analogies between electrons and cars to try to get electrons to behave in more efficient ways to flow more effectively from this place. Um, and uh, I welcome questions as we're going along. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to engage with you. you know, to wait till later. So, um, so I'm going to talk about how we can approach perfect one-dimensional electrical conduction, but I'm going to start out with what's different when we make things small, particularly for electrons. I know a bunch of you are chemistry teachers, and so you familiar with what happens with making things small all the way down to the atomic scale, but then we're going to go a little bit bigger than atoms. <clears throat> so, um, so when, when we think about electrical flow and electrical conduction, um, we might typically think about power lines or computer chips getting electrons into and out of uh, the transistors and the processor. Uh, on the other hand, um, so that's at large scales. Uh, computer chips, of course, can get pretty small, but I'm still talking about uh, millimeters or microns. That's still large scales. And you can see it under a microscope. It's many atoms across. But then we can make things much smaller, what I call the microscopic rather than macroscopic scale. And there we have atoms. <laughs> we know that electrons can be on only certain quantum states and can make transitions between those quantum states and electrons live in, in the orbitals. Um, and so how do we bridge the space between them and how does how does the macroscopic morph into the microscopic if we make things small? How do new phenomena emerge as we make things small? So uh, here I talk about the mesoscopic scale, intermediate between those two. So, um, so as we think about making things smaller, we should have some criteria for what is small. So when you make things small, uh, there are various associated energy scales with, uh, with a certain size scale. So, um, and usually as you make things smaller, the energies get bigger. Now, that may not be obvious, but if you think about it, if you, um, if you try to um, uh, send, if you try to smash atoms together, then if you smash them together lightly, they just bounce off of each other. If you smash them together harder, then you start kicking off the electrons. If you smash them together really hard, then, you, uh, then the nuclei collide. And so smaller and smaller light scales, you need more and more energy to, um, to manipulate. And that's true also in terms of a range of different energy scales. So as you make things smaller, um, you might think about a particular energy scale, and I'll give you examples of that 
is it bigger than the energy scale associated with temperature, associated with things thermally chilling around? And uh, so whether temperature looks big or small compared to that energy scale will affect things. For example, with atoms, um, is the temperature big or small compared to the energy to excite an electron off of an atom? <coughs> if temperature is big, then you'll be ripping off electrons and everything will be ionized as it was in the early universe uh, before some of you probably heard of cosmic microwave background radiation, the, the light that came not from the Big Bang, but from, uh, from not too much after the Big Bang. That was from the time when um, atoms stopped being ionized, when temperature became smaller than the energy to, to pull an electron off of, uh, of a hydrogen atom. And so we can compare energy scales with thermal energy. So as we try to confine electrons, we can confine electrons either in no dimensions, so we have everything's large in all three dimensions, or we can confine electrons so that they're in a, a narrow sheet, or a 1D wire, or a box. And so I'm going to um, step back for a moment and ask, since I'm going to be talking about two-dimensional systems and one-dimensional systems, uh, as, as science teachers and scientists, can you, do you know of any two-dimensional systems or one-dimensional systems? Is there anything that in this world that's, uh, that's 2D? Soap bubble. Oh, what? A soap bubble film? Excellent. A soap bubble film. So is it really 2D? It's, um, it has some thickness to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and, you know, another common example is, is paper. Yeah. You know, paper, is it really 2D? Well, not quite. If you look closely, it has some thickness. You know, if you have a ream of it, it's about this thick. Um, so what does it mean when we say something is, is two-dimensional or one-dimensional? It means that the other dimensions are small for whatever practical purpose we're considering. So for paper, usually you don't write on the side of the paper, you write on the <laughs> flat part. For soap bubbles, um, you're, uh, you can consider the, the physics of the soap bubble without worrying about that thickness. You can just treat it as um, a membrane with some surface tension. Uh, so um, similarly here, if we make um, electrons confined so that they're so small in one or two of the dimensions so that temperature becomes unimportant uh, compared to, say, quantum mechanical energies, then, um, then we can consider it as if it's really a one-dimensional system, even though we know that it does have some thickness. All right, so let's give an example of energies. Um, when you confine electrons to a small space, um, I think you've probably heard of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that if you know where something is perfectly, then you have no idea how fast it's moving. So, um, if some, especially if something is very light, like an electron, if you squeeze it down to a small space, then you know where it is. You know it's in that little box, and therefore it must be able to be moving very fast. In fact, it's zipping back and forth in that box really rapidly. The smaller the box, the faster it's moving. So, uh, so how does that manifest itself in something that you can actually see? Um, so uh, these vials over here, each of these is a vial of tiny little particles of material, a semiconducting material called cadmium selenide. So they're all different colors, but they're all the same material. Why are they different colors? So if you take big particles, by big here, I mean 8 nanometers. That's huge, right? Um, so if you take the big particles, they behave almost as if they were um, macroscopic. And so if you shine ultraviolet light on them, they glow red. They glow red because um, you can excite electrons from one range of energies to another, and then they drop down again. And the spacing between those two energies, what's called the gap, is, corresponds to light that's red. But as you make the particles smaller and smaller, that gap gets bigger because you have to spend the extra energy to squeeze down the electrons. The, um, the let's say, the higher energy band uh, gets higher and higher in order um, to accommodate representing the 
kinetic energy that the electrons have zipping around. So as you make these particles smaller and smaller, you shine the same light on, on this vial of particles, but the energy that, um, that comes out in dropping down from one range of, uh, of energies to another gets bigger and bigger, and so the light gets bluer until it becomes purple. So that's a very uh, vivid, visceral example of uh, how confinement energy, how quantum mechanics, um, is, is quite visible in the properties of collections of small objects. So if you want to get this to be important compared to room temperature, depending on the material, you need to make things nanometers to tens of nanometers. So you need to make them quite small. Uh, and these are scales that there are chemical techniques for making lots of, lots of particles that are about the same size. Um, there are also uh, techniques for uh, patterning things using computer design and then, um, and then writing with light or, or with electron beams to make very tiny, tiny features, which is done, what's done to uh, make computer chips, where you have to have not just lots of features that all look the same, but rather a rather elaborate layout. So we can make things in that range. And um, just as an aside, computer designers have uh, known for a long time that they're running toward problems as they make things smaller and smaller. There was the golden era where um, every year and a half you could pack twice as many transistors onto a chip, and so you made each one smaller, so you got more of them, and, um, and they were also lower power, so you didn't have to um, use as much power to run them, your battery would run longer, so everything got better. You can hack them. Oh, and they also get faster because they're smaller, so electrons can go across them faster. So everything got better as you made them smaller, and people made them smaller and smaller quite rapidly. Now, amazingly, Intel and AMD and other companies can still make transistors smaller and smaller, but you may have noticed your computers aren't really getting faster, and that's because you can't the, the switches in the computers, the transistors, don't work as well anymore. You can't turn them off. Because in quantum mechanics, um, if you try to make a barrier, but the barrier is too short, electrons can jump right across it. Tunnel. So there are things, from a computer designer perspective, uh, everything's going bad. All the things that they used to rely on don't work anymore uh, as they make things smaller. But from my perspective, I don't see a problem. Rather, I see an opportunity. There are new phenomena that occur at the nanoscale, and let's see, can we make, not say that the old things don't work anymore, let's say, can we make something new? Can we take advantage of those opportunities? So, let me tell you about <coughs> one, one of my favorite one-dimensional systems, that's a carbon nanotube. Um, uh, so, if you take graphite, uh, pencil lead, um, it's used for pencils because it's made up of sheets that um, easily slip against each other, and so when you write on a paper, these sheets slip off and form the, the dark line on the paper. Um, so here I'm showing you just a single uh, sheet of, of graphite, a hexagonal lattice that looks like chicken wire. This is known as graphene. It was discovered or rediscovered about a decade ago and was recognized with the Nobel Prize uh, recently. Um, and this picture just shows um, how you could imagine taking part of this sheet and curling it up into a ball that's called the um, Bucky Ball or Buckminster Fullerene. It's, uh, it has 60 carbon atoms and it was um, discovered um, earlier and also recognized with the Nobel Prize. Um, this is the core carbon nanotube that has not been recognized for the Nobel Prize. Um, so this is you know, made a, a cylinder uh, out of this sheet. Now this is not actually how people make, uh, make these. Rather, they tend to, to you can make carbon nanotubes typically by having a hot furnace with carbon, and uh, if you tune it right, then you, uh, uh, then you can grow tubes. Um, so I can tell people more about it if they're interested. But, uh, but these objects, tend to have a diameter of one or a few nanometers, uh, so not too many atoms across. And so uh, you can see that it's a very one-dimensional system. If you make one that's, uh, that's you can 
make these that are tens or hundreds of microns long, or even a millimeter long, and and yet they're uh, they're only a nanometer diameter. That's about as big an aspect ratio as we tend to have in scientific things. So uh, so how does it behave as an electrical wire? So if we think about a one-dimensional wire, um, I'd like to think of it as like a highway. So this, this is obviously not a highway in Northern California because there's only one car on it. <laughs> um, but if, you, if you're uh, in Canada and you are driving on a highway, then probably you can get where you're going pretty smoothly. We were discussing a little earlier what, if, what happens if you drive at 50 miles an hour for, um, for um, enough hours to, to reach a million miles. Well, clearly you need a, a long highway to... <laughs> <laughs> to do that, um, but you can drive pretty smoothly on a highway if there aren't a lot of cars on it, and it's because um, we have traffic laws. And I'm going to um, I'm going to get back to this, um, but uh, but basically, if you think about um, these cars driving along, um, the car just heads out, and you imagine you you put it on um, uh, cruise control, and you just keep going, and um, this is very much in contrast to, for those of you who think about Ohm's law in physics, that um, if you um, if you have a wire and you apply a voltage, then you get a current flowing, and if you make the wire twice as long, then you need to apply twice as much voltage to get the same current going because you have twice as much resistance. That happens because you launch electrons and then they get deflected. And you have to re-accelerate them, and then they get deflected. So you have to keep re-accelerating those electrons. What if you could get around that by just launching an electron and it would just keep going in the same direction? It never gets deflected. These one-dimensional systems offer the possibility of that because um, you can imagine you launch an electron, and in a one-dimensional system it has only two choices, either keep going or turn around. And what if you take um, inspiration from our traffic laws, and you say, let's create a two-lane highway, and let's make the law that even though cars can go both ways, or electrons can go both ways, there are no U-turns allowed. So if we can arrange, you know, just a simple thing to ask, no U-turns, then uh, an, an electron once launched must just keep going. So this, this wire, this highway has no resistance. Now, um, even though the wire has no resistance, there's still limited conductance. What do I mean by that? Normally we think that conductance is just one over resistance. <clears throat> but just like a highway, getting onto the highway and getting off of the highway is a bottleneck. You have to funnel down from something larger. Um, well, in, in, it's a little different. The analogy breaks down for electrons. Typically, have some bigger wire you have to funnel down from, um, but in any case, it's a bottleneck. And it turns out that the conductance of the highway for every lane is e squared over h, the electron charge squared over Planck's constant. It's not an accidental number; it's a combination of constants of nature. And it turns out that a carbon nanotube has four lanes, um, uh, two lanes for the two different spins of the electron two for some, some other orbital degree of freedom that electrons can spiral around to the right or to the left. Um, and so um, that, that turns out to correspond to six and a half kiloohms. So this, <laughs> this one nanometer wire, it has a substantial resistance, and that resistance is all just getting into the wire and getting out of it. There's no resistance along the wire. We can make it as long as we want. It, there won't be any more resistance. And so, so that, that sort of gets you thinking, well, what if you could um, maybe pack a lot of these wires together? Could you do better than, uh, than copper, which is pretty close to the best electrical conductor we have? Does anyone know what's the best electrical conductor at room temperature? Gold. Silver. 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 Yeah. Silver. Gold is more valuable, but silver is, <laughs> is close to my heart. It's the best. Best conductor. So, so even silver is a little bit expensive to uh, to wire your house with. So, in, unless you're really into audio and you like to read strange websites uh, about uh, about.
Ohio and yield silver that they're going to be better speaker wire. They don't buy that. Um, <laughs> um, silver is a little bit better as a conductor than copper. Um, but we could imagine that if you make a long enough wire and you pack enough of these together, that maybe you could make a conductor better than silver. Um, and more importantly, better than copper. Um, and um, so maybe you could do that in computer chips, and you could run current over 10 microns to a millimeter with less resistance than, uh, than copper. Right now, um, computer chips, about half the power is wasted just getting the current into and out of the transistors, not switching the transistors, just getting the current into and out of them. And um, so if we could improve that, your cell phones could last for longer, your laptops. Um, if you think really grand scale, then uh, about 10% of the power that we, um, electrical power that we generate in this country is um, dissipated in transmission. So if we could avoid that, we could save a substantial amount of power, but equally importantly, we could locate power plants in places that are efficient for the power plants, but not close to population centers. So imagine the Sahara Desert. There aren't a lot of people living near there, but there's a lot of sunlight. Right now, it's not economical to put a solar plant there because you'd have to transmit the electricity too far. What if you could make wires that over hundreds of kilometers are better than copper? So that's the sort of thinking that, um, that I've been doing about this. All right, that was a fairy tale. Uh, in fact, um, we all know real world um, uh, roads, and uh, this, is, this is, as the physicists will say, translationally invariant. It's the same all around the world. Uh, so this is a picture from Norway, from India, from Washington, <coughs> D.C., um, traffic jams. So uh, cars interact with each other, electrons interact with each other. We need to worry about this. Um, all these advantages of 1D wires can easily become disadvantages because of interactions. Because, um, and so here's a little illustration of this. If you can't read it, it says, snail crossing 100 miles ahead. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you probably know that in traffic flow, if someone slows down, and the next person slows down, the next person slows down, that can leave a ripple effect so that uh, even an hour later at the same location on the road, um, everyone's slowing down. And so you should try to do your part as much as possible, drive smoothly at the average speed that you'd like to drive. The only problem is that someone's going to uh, go in front of you. And, uh, that's what it is. So, um, but as much as possible, try to drive smoothly. But, you know, for electrons, <laughs> Uh, in 1D systems, <coughs> if you can turn around, if we don't have this no U-turn requirement, then just a small bump in the potential, a small non-uniformity, is enough to bring uh, conduction to a standstill. So we need to worry about that. All right, can we make a two-lane highway for electrons? I pointed out uh, the carbon nanotube uh, has um, some advantages, but it turns out that room temperature doesn't conduct quite as well as I promised because there's, there's no rule that there's no U-turn. In carbon nanotubes, you can have U-turns. So can we implement this no U-turn condition? So here I'm going to get to the most technical part of the talk, but, um, but I hope you'll find it entertaining and you don't need to worry too much about the equations. So, um, all right, so special relativity. Um, uh, you know that in special relativity, um, length and time can seem to be stretched. Um, it turns out that also electric and magnetic fields are changed when you look at them um, from the point of view of something that's moving fast. So how does that work? Um, imagine that there's a charged particle um, that's moving in the presence of an electric field. So there's an electric field, let's say, pointed horizontally, and uh, this particle is moving um, perpendicular to that electric field, then it feel, if we now pretend that we're sitting on the electron, zipping along, and we're in its uh, frame of reference, then it sees a magnetic field. <laughs> what does it mean for a stationary particle to see a magnetic field? After all, we know that charged particles get bent by magnetic fields, they move in circles, but that's only if they're moving in the magnetic field. What if they're just sitting still? The answer is that every electron acts like a little magnet. It has a spin. 
um, and there's a little magnet associated with it. And so if you have a magnetic field, it's going to want the spin to point in this particular direction um, along that magnetic field. So, all right, so we get a magnetic field that's pointing perpendicular to that electric field, perpendicular to the direction of motion. And um, so if we double the um, electric field, we double the magnetic field. If we um, instead move twice as fast, we again double the magnetic field. And so, um, and, but this magnetic field depends on the direction of motion. So if an electron's moving to the right, then the spin will want to be up. If the electron's moving to the left, the spin will want to be down. So now imagine that you have a two-lane highway where all the electrons that are moving this way have spin up, and all the electrons moving that way have spin down. Now you can start to see that it might be hard to turn around because you have to flip your spin. You have to flip this little magnet to turn around. You can't just, can't just simply turn around. And um, it turns out that actually we can create a system where, um, where symmetry of nature is called time reversal symmetry, the fact that the laws of physics are the same um, forward or backward in time. So that if you, if you take a movie of a particle moving and you play it to someone and you say, did I play that movie forward or backward, they won't be able to tell you. Um, so that symmetry of nature uh, turns out to guarantee that you should have no U-turns in the system. So you can set up, set up that system, and, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it because we don't have enough time left, but there's an even more powerful uh, traffic strategy that we have for cars. Um, even better than two-lane highways is divided highways, where uh, then you can't U-turn because there, there are no, no lanes to go in the other direction. Um, and so that's much more powerful. And uh, so I'm going to show you a system where we can make that kind of highway. Um, uh, and so this, here's a, an image of a uh, sample that, um, that we made working with a group at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, they, uh, a theorist at Stanford, Xiao Cheng Sang, predicted that we, one could make this kind of divided highway where um, electrons would go around one way around the sample, and on the other side of the sample they would go the other way, um, and we break the law of nature that tells you that you can only, um, have, that if you can go one way, you can go the other way. Um, we break it by putting on a magnetic field, or in this case, by magnetizing <coughs> the sample. It's actually, the sample is, in addition to its other weird properties, uh, a magnet. And so, uh, you can see that the sample looks rather crude. Um, I talked earlier about lithography, the, um, the method of patterning using computers and fancy machines, structures down to the nanoscale. Um, we're really good at that in my research group, uh, borrowing tools from the semiconductor industry. But when we try to do lithography on this material, which, um, which goes by the name of chrome doped bismuth antimony telluride. Uh, I won't mention it again, um, but it's, it's what's called a topological insulator. Um, when we tried to do it on that material, uh, it always messed up the material. It always added lots of electrons to the material so that electrons could move everywhere, not just at the edge of the sample. Um, and so we reverted to what I had um, fondly but um, uh, humorously referred to as cutting-edge lithography, which is taking a sharp uh, knife blade and cutting out the shape that we wanted. Uh, this was what the group at Tsinghua who first worked on this did, and uh, we learned to do it. So my student has a very fine hand, so you can see that this is about 150 microns. You know. um, uh, I don't think I can do that anymore. Um, uh, and what we discovered is that indeed we could get electrons to go one way on the bottom of this uh, structure and one and the other way on the top, and uh, and would never turn around. So you could make you know this is millimeters in scale, and there's absolutely no turning around. I can say absolutely none to a part in ten to the four, part in ten thousand. Measure that. Yes. Does 
the presence of a magnetic field of any kind slow down the speed of the electron? Um, so the question was, does a magnetic field slow down electrons? So the um, so there's a broad subject of what magnetic fields do to resistance of samples, and um, they do generally, magnetic fields usually cause increases in resistance. It's not so much that they slow down the electrons, but electrons, I mean, how fast do you think electrons are going in the wires that feed these lights? Thousands. Well, thousands. Very sinusoidal system. Uh, they don't really go anywhere, but right. like they're off. Right. <laughs> so, so good. Um, they move sinusoidally. We have a 60 uh, cycles per second signal. All right, let's just think within one cycle, uh, within half a cycle where they're moving one way. How fast are they moving? A few centimeters an hour. Okay. Excellent. A few centimeters an hour. They're moving extremely slowly. And yet, they're also moving extremely fast. So electrons in metals move at a good fraction of the speed of light, but they only get a little ways before they get deflected. And uh, then they get deflected again and again, and so they're effectively diffusing. They're moving very slowly, uh, just as, as Stuart said, but instantaneously they're moving extremely fast. So uh, magnetic fields don't change that really fast instantaneous speed very much, but they do affect this diffusion. Uh, and it really depends a lot on the details of the material. Um, does that yes. So, um, so I would say, so this is this is at this point something that uh, we're working on actively now, trying to understand how perfect is the conduction at the edges. To circle back to what I said before, could one pack lots of these wires in a tight space and get something better than copper? Um, it looks like it's possible. So right now we have one wire and another wire that's <coughs> a millimeter away from it, that's going to be no good at all because remember each of these wires has a resistance of 26 kilo ohms. So it's not going to be, if we try to pack wires a millimeter apart and each one has 26 kilo ohms, it's not going to do better than copper even over kilometer length scales. Um, but it turns out that we can pack them much more tightly. We've now learned how to do lithography on this and we can cut this into stripes so we make many, many more edges and we can pack these wires more tightly. We have another problem, which is this only so far works at low temperature. Um, by low, I mean it should work at tens of degrees above absolute zero, and in fact, we need to go below a tenth of a degree above absolute zero. We don't understand why. So, um, so we need to understand why our expectations are not being met, and also, are there better materials, and already better materials are coming out, that we can push up to higher temperature. And I would say, you know, there may be a 5% chance that this will really impact electrical transmission and computer chips. Um, so, uh, so with that, um, let me just uh, recap a little bit. When you make things small, they behave differently. They behave differently because of quantum mechanics, interactions of electrons, which I didn't talk about very much, um, and all kinds of, I just talked about electrical behavior, but optical, mechanical, all kinds of behaviors behave differently in nanoscale structures. Uh, I think you can get a long way with these analogies between traffic flow of cars and electrons, even though they're only analogies, and so you need to rely on the actual descriptions of how the electrons move, but I haven't lied very much in this. Um, and uh, you can discover new things when you go into new regimes. And this uh, is fascinating to me just from a basic point of view that there are these new phenomena, but I'm also interested in ways that they can affect how the world works and stuff that we can do. Uh, so let me acknowledge I've had many students in my group work on one-dimensional conduction over the years. This is just a selection of the ones whose work I presented most. And I also want to, uh, to give thanks to uh, the Center for Excellence in Education um, you know them, at least in part, through their, um, their teacher programs, but, uh, but, um, but something else that they do and have done um, since the mid-80s uh, is to run a program for uh, high school juniors who are rising seniors um, called um, the Research Science Institute. 
And I was a student at that program in uh, the summer of 89, and then I was a counselor at that program in the summer of 90 before I went to college, and it really affected a lot of my thinking about, uh, about science and, um, and how, to, how to communicate, how to um, connect with people. So, uh, so I'd like to give thanks to see you both for inviting me today and for this long heritage of connection. Thanks. Thank you.